It's me, Ernest Hancock from Phoenix, Arizona, broadcasting from the BEA, beautiful studios of Freedoms of the Nest, freedomsphoenix.com. And we're going to take on uh, all the issues. Well, what would libertarians say about um, uh, once I write a book, I put it out there, I don't own it no more. You know, or you bought the book, now do you own it? And when the word's on it. And what about uh, music, video? DVDs, How, you know, intellectual property. This has always been a, the issue. You know, I haven't made up my mind yet. And I'm a, we'll see if I can make it up today, because we have someone who's going to tell me all about it. Stefan Kinsella. Now, I want to get this out right up uh, at the top here. So you guys, you want to know how to get this guy. Kinsella is spelled K-I-N-S-E-L-L-A. KinsellaLaw.com. Now, if you go to KinselaLaw.com, you can see a lot of good stuff on there. Now, I want to get right to it. Stephen Kinsella has published many articles relating to patents, private property rights, intellectual property. You can find them on Mises web pages, on Lou Rockwell. You know, it's a, and and he came to my attention from one of our readers. Man, just went off on it. He said, "Oh, you got to read this." He's author of the book Against Intellectual Property. Stephen Kinsella, I got you there. I'm here, Ernest. Nice to be here. You know, Stephen, it's a pleasure to have you. And and this is a I, I've done shows years past on this issue, and I, I and I don't remember I was ever comfortable enough to be able to explain the position from a libertarian standpoint to someone else. And I'm hoping you're going to help me with it. This is what I have done. I was so interested in doing this show that I didn't read your article on purpose. Well, that's okay. We have it all figured out now. We can, we can poop it out to you really easily. No, no, no. Let me tell you why. What happens is, is when you read uh, articles like this, I, I'm sure you, because you had such an impact on my readers, that they were like, you know, oh, this guy, he's it. This is it. And I was afraid that if I read it, it would be like you and I uh, talking about a movie that we both saw and the audience hadn't seen. So, sure. I'm, what, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, you know, the fresh perspective. I, I held, I'm, I'm, I'm guarantee you as soon as we talk, I'm going to read it. <laughs> okay, no problem. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to just be totally fresh on this issue and let's define what we're going to be talking about first. Intellectual property. Define that for me in the audience. Well, intellectual property is a term used by primarily by people who support legislation or laws that give you rights in intangible things such as patterns of information, such as um, the pattern of information that represents a novel or a painting or the idea that represents a, an invention, like a method of doing something or the way you arrange a, your own property to make it do something useful, like a, like a new mousetrap. Uh, or something like that. So basically, these people believe that the government should step in and grant rights in the way things are arranged or the way that people use their property. Okay, now, now I understand. Let's go ahead and go back in time. Let's go ahead and go to a time where there wasn't um, government, and, uh, you know, Og invented the wheel. Okay. Okay, then... Uh, I, I I have to see there's some time between Og inventing the wheel and us getting to where there's some government entity saying uh, uh, you can't use the wheel unless you pay him some money to use his wheel. Sure. So okay, I, well, let's when did that happen? Um, first of all, let's, I mean, uh, in my opinion, true libertarians don't even believe in the state. They believe in government in terms of rules, but not the state. But even some uh, minarchist libertarians believe in some minimal government. But uh, the most they believe in is basically a system of rules that protect your rights to use things that otherwise would be fought over, right? These are called rivalrous goods or scarce resources. So in other words, if we lived in a world where there was magic and you could just look at your neighbor's car or house and blink your eyes and conjure up another one and make your own, there would be no problem because you would have your own house. You wouldn't be taking your neighbor's house. But in the world we live in, things are scarce or rivalrous these material goods in the real world. We need to use these things to survive and to live, obviously. But the problem is only one guy gets to use these things at a time. And unless you have rules, and everyone's fighting over them, and you have no property rules at all, and you have eternal war of all against all and the kind of anarchy that, that people disparage and fight. So we have rules that say who gets to use these things that otherwise – uh, only one person could use at a time, or people would have to fight over. Okay, well, let's go back. I, you know, we gotta go back in time some more because mm -hmm. I'm I'm going. These rules were uh, tradition. 
You know, they're passed down by songs. I mean, you know, there's, I want to know where these rules came from. What's the first uh, recollection that you have in history to where you have some kind of rule? I mean, I know what the rule used to be. It's all the kings or it's all well, gods. Well, let's, let's think about just animals, animals that have no sense of morals whatsoever. Even a dog recognizes his bone and his bowl of food. If you approach too close, he starts growling because you're approaching his territory. There's sort of an innate or a natural connection between a person or a thing that uses things and the things he's using or possessing at a given time. And, of course, in the past and without the government, and there's many of studies on this, many of intellectual studies and, and articles and things like this, about how people come up with rules on their own to live peacefully among each other. And then, and then these civilized people, which is the bulk of society, it has to be for society to survive, of course, they come up with ways to deal with the occasional person who's an outlaw, who doesn't respect rights, who basically is like an animal or a force of nature. So you always have to deal with things that are, that are going to uh, you know, be a threat to you. But people that want to get along, people that want to be civilized, they want cooperation, they want to help each other, but they want to be able to succeed in the world, they tend to agree on these rules. And even in the age of kings, there was no such thing as a systemized recognition of rights to these intellectual things or rights to tangible things, horses and carriages and castles and food and things like this. Okay, do, when did it happen, though? I mean, when did we start in the U.S. Constitution? They start talking about promoting the sciences and arts. You know, you got a problem right there. But um, patents and all this other yeah. stuff. Where did that so, concept come from? Well, so let's talk about it for a second. What you have now is you have now everyone is in today's world, and libertarians should be especially uh, uh, acute to this. In today's world, everyone, even lawyers, even libertarians, are used to thinking of law as what the, the legislature enacts or passes. Right. In other words, when you say a law, people think some kind of written, printed bill that a legislature has enacted. Whereas two, three, four hundred, five hundred years ago, law was not considered to be legislature. Legislation was considered to be sort of a, a, a rare thing that every now and then came in and that sort of invaded the province of what true law was. True law was with, when various people, experts, judges, uh, philosophers, the common man, basically recognize what justice was, okay? And justice arose from custom, from tradition, from dealings with people, from repeated rulings, from contract, from agreements, things like this. And it was sort of a, a gradually accumulated doctrine of justice-related knowledge. So this is what a lot of people refer to as common law? Exactly, common law. And uh, it's sort of a misnomer in the, in the sense that people equate that with English law, in, in matter of fact, the, the ancient Roman law 2,000 years ago was basically a decentralized common law type of system. So, in fact, the original common Roman law and the, and the English common law are similar in, in their form, and they both resulted in fairly libertarian uh, bodies of law that protected property rights. Um, now, what happens is nowadays, just as people see law as being what the government decrees as, as being law, which is a positivist conception of law, um, and a legislation conception of law, they also will defend, even libertarians will defend IP based upon natural law principles. They'll say that, well, we have a natural right to our bodies and things that we find and, and buy and create, and also we have a natural right to intellectual things that we, that we create. But the interesting thing is the origin of IP rights, unlike the origin of tan the rights in tangible things like land, which is a natural right, the origin is not at all of natural rights. Even in the Constitution, the founders, Jefferson, these guys had big misgivings about IP law. They did it, but they explicitly recognized that it is not a natural right. It did not follow from Locke's theories about natural rights. It was only a prudential thing done, sort of on utilitarian grounds, to try to you know, give incentives to create things they thought would be good for the country. It was sort of an early type of tinkering, like we do now on a widespread scale. But if you go back in time, okay, and now the funny thing is the advocates of IP law, like the libertarians who advocate IP law, they will vociferously deny that it's a monopoly granted by the government. Okay, okay a monopoly granted by the government. Let's go ahead and leave it there because I don't want to lose our place. You're, you're, on a, you're on a good rant here, man. I need, I need you to pick up right where you left off, would I'll you do please? It. Okay, when we come back here on to declare your independence, I got, I got a million questions, and hopefully there are a lot of the questions that you would ask. So we'll go ahead and we'll take calls late in this hour, maybe, because I don't want to get off on I want to get all the information from my guest, Stefan Kinsella. We'll be right back.
It's time for Declare Your Independence with Ernest Hancock. And I went, I'm going into uh, uh, almost 60 seconds. I'm in violation of intellectual property rights. I'm going to jail. <laughs> may, may, maybe not. Well, we're going to find out. You know, my guest is Stephen Kinsella, Kinsella, K-I-N-S-E-L-L-A, law. Dot com. You're going to want to check this guy out because I've been looking for someone just like Stefan to be able to help me out. Well, you left off. You're talking about the formation of the country and the Constitution, and Jefferson and the boys were kind of, eh, this yeah. intellectual property right thing is, you know, we, we'll, we'll, we'll give it a little bit of credence here just to get along, but, you know, we're not big fans of it. So go ahead and pick it up where you left off. Well, I'm trying to walk you through how sort of my formation process went because I'm a libertarian and I was actually, I'm a patent lawyer as well. Well, so you know, I was actually trying to defend the idea at first, and uh, I, I'm trying to show you how I came to it and how the best way to look at it is. I mean, Please. listen, you talk to advocates of IP law, and you say, "Look, it's just a government-granted privilege or monopoly." They will vociferously deny this. But where did these things arise from? And the primary forms of it that are problems are copyright and patent, which are federal legislation. Okay. Now, copyright originated in 1623 in England in a statute called, wait for it, the Statute of Monopolies. Now, back then, governments were a lot more honest, right? They didn't, they didn't hide what they did. As I think in the 40s, we had a Department of War, right? And what did it do? It waged war. Now, what do we call it? We call Department, it Department of Defense. Of, <laughs> you know, Department of Defense. And all these, we have all these cute modern euphemisms. And it's kind of sad to see libertarians retreating to these things. But it was clearly a monopoly grant. Now, where do patents come from? Patents protect inventions. If you remember what patents were originally, you know, the king would grant a patent to some supplicant, someone who was a favored person or a noble or a lord who wanted to be the only guy who could make bread in this town or the only guy who had the right to sell, you know, this type of thing at the port. So it was just gov- it was mercantilism writ large. Now, what the founders of our country did was, um, they knew and they admitted explicitly, if you read Jefferson's writings, they admitted that there is no natural right to um, inventions and copyrights and things like this. They said, we're doing it prudentially only. And in fact, in the Constitution, they don't require IP law to be mandated. They only give Congress the authority to, to do it if they want to, and only for limited times, which should show you right there the distinction between real property and between uh, this artificial privilege. Okay, you got to help me out. I'm not as learned when you say mm-hmm. prudentially. Define that word. Well, what I mean is, um, so the, the founders were thinking that, look, we're going to have a new government we're, we're, we're forming, and we have all these you know, authors are bitching about you know, their royalties, royalties and things like this. Why don't we give Congress the power to grant them a temporary monopoly that will give them the right to get some kind of royalties for a little while, uh, and give them a little incentive to produce these books, okay, things like this. In other words, the motivation behind these laws was completely utilitarian or wealth maximization based. It was prudential in the sense that the government was trying to engineer things. It was trying to it just, just like it does now when it, when it has all these government grants to uh, favored causes. Which makes my point on this show often: the Constitution, just how it all started, man. <laughs> Absolutely. I'll, I'll be honest with you. In, in the last several years, I've, I've come to really become down on the Constitution. I'm really tired of, of American libertarians and thinking of a, the original American founding as some kind of proto-libertarian paradise. The, Amer- the original American founding was not libertarian. Uh, I would say not at all. It was basically a constitutional coup. The Constitution was a centralizing document to seize power, and it has resulted in what we have now. So I don't know it how libertarians can think it was a great thing. No, I'm with you, brother. Keep going. So, so basically what you have is you have the simple situation that for us to live among each other in peace and prosperity. Okay, now I'll get a little bit abstract for a second. I don't know how familiar you are, your listeners are, with the, sort of the, the, the Austrian economics idea. 
of, of human action, okay? It's a very simple idea, and the idea is that all humans act in the world. And now, what does it mean to act? It means you look around and you see what you want to accomplish. That's your goal or your end. And you see what means you have at your disposal to accomplish these ends. That is, you know, something you can choose or act on that will accomplish your end. Okay? And then you use the information in your head to consult, uh, to decide what to do. So the means that you choose, like, you know, let's say you take a bowl and some eggs and some flour to make a cake. Okay? These are the means that you need to make the cake. The cake is your goal. The flour or the bowl are your capital goods or your ingredients. You need to own those things because if someone else takes them, then you can't make your cake, right? Mm -hmm. uh, these things are scarce resources or rivalrous goods. They're material goods. They're tangible things that only one person can benefit from at a time. And if we don't have rules on how to use these things, then there's going to be fighting over them or no one will get to use them and no cakes will be made at all. But if property rights are assigned, then people can use them peacefully because they know who owns these things. Now, you and I could both make a cake at the same time using our own ingredients, using the same recipe. This recipe is information that guides our knowledge, or guides our decisions. So you can see that we don't even have a conflict over this recipe or this information. You can use it. I can use it at the same time. There's never even a possibility of conflict over it, so property rights don't arise even in the first place. So that's sort of a natural rights, libertarian perspective and property rights. That's the distinction between ideas or information, things that guide your actions, and means, which are things that you have to use in your action that only one person can use at a time, and things that we have to have property rights in. What? You know, <laughs> you have to... Yeah, okay, property rights, not intellectual property rights. So my thing is, is that the intellectual property right is like the owning of an idea, you know, yeah. the owning of um, an idea that's put on paper. I mean, if I buy a book, well, I you know, it's mine. You know, I bought it, it's mine. But now with digital electronics and, you know, for music and videos and all this and the pirating of, you know, Lord knows what, you have the, the concept that, okay, I can replicate my cake, you know, uh, by pushing a digital button and I get uh, whatever it is that I, you know, the book reproduced on somebody's Kindle. So right, but, but, yeah, I mean, let's suppose you have a bicycle, okay? Yeah. I, I, I covet your bicycle and I want it. Now, if I take your bicycle, why do you object to this? Because you don't have your bicycle anymore, right? I mean, yeah. I'm taking it from you. That's no, 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 no. I'm agreeing you. with you. No, I'm making the point that you're not taking anything from somebody when you replicate this by pushing a button. Correct. They get and they get to use whatever they want. They got their book. You know, basically, copying is not theft. This is the point that libertarians need to emphasize and realize. Okay, well, I'm, what I'm looking at is the origination of this. What you're saying is that. Yeah, it's kind of this. They just made it up. They just made it. It's not really a fundamental, real no. property right in anything. It's right. just because they just made a law saying that you you can't. Right. So I get your question now. So 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 here here's how I would answer that. The, how they made it up was there are two different basic ways of justifying legal policy or, or or laws. Right. One is the natural rights way, which I adhere to, and many libertarians adhere to. Another is a sort of pragmatic you know, way that we come up with laws that do the, the, the most good for the most number, which you could say is utilitarian or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I can go through the different arguments for natural rights theories of IP, but even the originators of this in the Constitution didn't think it was a natural right. They basically said, if you let the government grant these temporary monopoly privileges to certain people who apply for them, then society will be better off overall. Now, the thinking was this. Okay, in society A without copyright, let's say, there's, you know, X amount of wealth. Okay, in society B, we have copyright law, and now we have more books being written because of the incentive effect. And it does restrict people's liter liberty a little bit because they can't copy these books for a while, etc. But we're all better off because there's more books being written. That's the original idea, that we're better off because there's more innovation being stimulated by these laws. Okay, I understand the argument, and we're going to get into more details about that very argument. If you do not have a financial incentive for you to create things that other people are willing to buy, would you create them? Would they get created? Are we better off because we have this intellectual property? I don't know. I always side on. Freedom's the answer. We'll be right back. Roads? It's the Ernest Hancock Show. Where we're going, there aren't any roads.
I know you're out there. I can feel you now. I know that you're afraid. You're afraid of us. You're afraid of change. I don't know the future. I didn't come here to tell you how this is going to end. I came here to tell you how it's going to begin. I'm going to hang up this phone, and then I'm going to show these people what you don't want them to see. I'm going to show them a world without you. A world without rules and controls, without borders or boundaries. A world where anything is possible. Where we go from there is a choice I leave to you. Stefan Kinsella is going to help me out. Where do we go without the rules, the borders, the boundaries, a world without controls? Well, part of that control is all about trying to control us into being productive for whatever they think we should be, which is, you know, you can start off right there. I mean, we had a discussion. We were talking about some of the provisions in uh, Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. The first thing it does is gives them the ability to tax me, and I said we don't need to even go any further. So, you know, I, so I, I get it. Well, one of the parts in there is also to promote uh, the arts and sciences and patents and all this kind of stuff, and I'm going – I'm, you know, whenever the government gets involved in promoting anything, it becomes a benefit in the government promotion. And I might as well just call him king. So I, you know, I, I can understand that uh, going down the road of defining what intellectual property is and how far to the point that, you know, Mickey Mouse gets to be, you can't draw it forever. I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if the benefit of having an intellectual property right, well, well, you have an intellectual property right, but you have intellectual property enforcement of your ownership or something by a government on an idea in the long term benefits humanity, the individual, anybody, uh, freedom. I, 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 don't, I don't know. I mean, we haven't really had that opportunity except in the uh, early days where you, you know, Og made wheel. You know, and everybody, you go, that's a good idea. I'm going to do that idea. Well, if we had it back then, would we have more wheels, less wheel? We never have invented the wheel without property rights. Oh, we didn't have one. I mean, he just had a utilitarian use of it. I mean, these are the kind of questions that just, you know, pop off on top of my head. So now we're looking uh, to Stefan Kinsella, K-I-N-S-E-L-L-A law.com which is a patent attorney that made a case for intellectual property and had his mind changed. So let's go ahead and pick up where we left off. Stefan, go ahead and help me out. Yeah, I mean, look, we libertarians look at things in a principled way, right? We try to look at the right and wrong of things. I mean, when we start talking about giving the government power to try to give the right incentives this way and that way, I mean, it's obviously unworkable. And, and uh, you know, the idea that we would only have innovation with, without these government monop- monopolies, is ridiculous. They're, they're only a couple of hundred years old in a systematic way, and of course we had progress before then. And if you think about it in a sort of general way, what these laws are opposed to is what we call learning, right, or the distribution of knowledge. When people talk to each other, when they observe things, when they study things, when they learn about all the uh, immense accomplishments of humanity over our, our history, this is learning. This is a good thing, right? There's nothing wrong with the transmission of knowledge. There's nothing wrong with the preservation of knowledge. There's nothing wrong with the spread of the body of human knowledge and its gradual increase over time. The more things we learn, the more things that are passed down from one person to the other, from one generation to the next, the, the, the more sophisticated the body of knowledge that we have that we can rely on when we make decisions, right? When we decide what ends we choose and what means we can choose uh, we can use to achieve these ends. The, so this, this is, is the point. Thing. This is the point that I was making in the first hour. I was trying to share with the audience my own personal experience on how you know if if you have all these controls on the information that you get, um, uh, who can and can't uh, put a link to some other site, who can and can't um, send a PDF to a friend of a book on the whatever you share peer to peer for movies and and music and on and on and on. I'm you know I'm going. Where, where, who, where's the harm? And, and 
so of course someone will say, hey man, I, I own that song in perpetuity forever and always, amen, and I'm the Beatles, and gosh darn it, you can't play that unless I get a cut. Right. And I'm going, all right, well, you know, is there a benefit in having such a rule or law? Right. And I tell you where I come to being a patent attorney, there was an issue that was of interest to me that um, I, I started thinking along these lines, and I'm going, all right. Somebody out there is working on fill-in-the-blank uh, invention, you know, the 100-mile-per-gallon uh, carburetor, the mm-hmm. zero-point energy, de la, Tesla, I can push a button, make enough, I'm off-grid, whatever thing. And there was a gentleman, his name was uh, Moray, I think it was. I was watching a, a DVD one time, and he would go to the patent office and look for certain traits that he knew people were trying to patent mm-hmm. ideas about producing zero-point energy. Mm-hmm. And he was going, you know, I, I, they can't patent that because they won't let them. They will not let them patent. It works, don't work, who cares? But he won't let you have a patent on something you say is a perpetual energy, whatever. He goes, but I knew what to look for. They would say, you know, a temperature thing, this or that. or And I go look for that stuff. Aha, I recognize this device. I go talk to the guy, try and get the information and such. So then I started thinking, I'm going, is it really at a point to where the only people that would create such a device are those that would do it only if they could get a patent? And I'm going, would they create it anyway? Are, are they always looking for the profit motive? Are they looking for the intellectual property right that would give them, make them wealthy? Well, maybe. I mean, you know, that's kind of what the concept was in the Constitution. We're going to provide for patents and so on so that it will be an encouragement of these people to do whatever they get some kind of benefit from it. But then I'm going, you know, I'm. where is the detriment in all of the improvements of ideas, and especially with the Internet and all the sharing and the overlap, you've got so much opportunity to expand the wealth of knowledge that we all have access to. That in and of itself is of enormous wealth, not only to individuals, but to humanity in general and the planet. So I'm going, if you got government out of the way of me being able to make the better mousetrap using whatever intellectual uh, advancement there is out there, would we all not be better served? And I bet you that was kind of the argument Jefferson and these guys were making, but we kind of will pay, I don't know, some homage to some traditional whatever. So that is where we're really at. Is the I, mean, I think that Jefferson and the founders were leery of government monopolies, but they figured this was a systematic, institutionalized thing that was out in the open, and you'd have an office of you know public officials who could approve these inventions. It wasn't just for specialized favorites of the king. Now this was open to democracy. In a way, this is a case where democracy has made things worse off, right? Whereas before, these monopolies were sporadic and sort of um, sparsed out and seen as monopolies. Now they're sort of democratized and available to the masses for just, uh, you know, uh, applying through the bureaucracy for your for your rights. Um, but, you know, the, the funny thing is, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's pretty absurd to try to defend IP on natural rights grounds. So most defenses of it are on these utilitarian grounds. Well, that's but, why I'm trying to get to that point. I'm trying to go, <laughs> are we better served as, you know, is there a utilitarian case to be made for having intellectual property monopolized in the hands of somebody with a seal from the king that then it's not available to everybody to improve everything? And all i got to do is look at open source software. I mean... Well, here, here's what we know. We know. We know a few things. We know that there's innovation without patents and without copyrights. Maybe there's not as much, but there's definitely innovation. So you can't say there's none. You can say there's not enough, but if you say there's not enough, then maybe you want to advocate the government uh, having some kind of prize board to give people millionaire grants when they come up with great ideas, which some libertarians actually favor ridiculously. Okay, So we know that. We also know that there's a cost to the patent and the copyright system, a big cost. And we also know that it's subject to abuse. For example... There are literally books banned in the name of copyright, literally. people. Uh, Susan Boyle was literally prevented recently from singing uh, a song on this, uh, on this television show because they couldn't clear the copyright. I mean, people's actions and their use of their bodies is literally prevented, almost like slavery. The, uh, the, the former CEO of HP, this herd guy, is, may be prevented from taking a job 
with um, with this other company, Oracle, because of trade secret law. So these the consequences are are severe and dire. So we know these things. We also know that the advocates of IP justify these things on the grounds that it will make us all better off. But you know what we know? They haven't proved their case. In fact, there have been dozens of studies over the years, and they all that I've seen, they all are either inconclusive or they conclude that patent and copyright laws reduce overall innovation. So in other words, they impose a cost on society, and in exchange for that, we get reduced innovation and reduced creativity. You know, and that can really more easily that case can be made when you're dealing with the speed of the internet open source software adding on to other people's ideas and i and we can see it much easier now than we probably had in the past we'll talk about it more when we come back here on declare your independence in just a little bit and now live from the studios of freedom's phoenix ernest hancock there's a man going around taking names And he decides who to free and who to blame. Everybody won't be treated all the same. There'll be a golden ladder reaching down when the man comes around. Oh, and the man be a-coming around. That's what we're talking about here on Declare Your Independence of Me. Ernest Hancock, my special guest, Stefan Kinsella, K-I-N-S-E-L-L-A, Kinsella Law. Dot com. This is a good resource for you guys. We have it up on Freedoms Phoenix. You go to today's archive, get all the goodies and a lot of the articles and stuff that uh, Stefan has written and been a big impact on the readers. And I'll be, you know, looking forward to reading all your goodies. But. I want to go ahead and uh, we're, we're talking about. We're gonna. We asked Stefan if he could stay over at the top of the hour because I know we're not going to finish to my satisfaction. And he's agreed to do that, so thank you, Steve. Sure. So what we're going to go ahead and do is just summarize real quick where we're at. We have the idea that we can. Uh, I, I, we would, you know, can we call it an axiom? I, I guess we can. It's a self-evident truth that you know, if I'm holding on to something I made, it's mine. I got it. I I acquired it. I produced it. Whatever. I can hold it, and it's mine. My, 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 my. You know, property rights in uh, an object, property rights in land. That's mine. Now, of course, you can argue about how you got to rent it through property taxes of the government, everything, that's a whole other issue. But the concept of property rights, this is, you know, the, the per, that's why I said declare your independence with Ernest Hancock. Because Declaration of Independence is very clear. The purpose of government, defend individual rights. If they're not doing that, then they're bad guys, okay? Whoever you can call them, whatever, and you can wrap them whatever colored flag, doesn't matter. They're taking your stuff without your permission, bad guys, okay? So you know what I think about the government there. So what happens is, is that now we've got to the concept of, all right, we're going to have this government protect my property rights, well, then they, in, even in the Constitution, and as you alluded to, you know, the, the founders were kind of, eh, we're, we're not, you know, big giant falling on a sword on this one, but, you know, we'll go ahead with this utilitarian kind of argument. But the idea was, is that by encouraging people to get patents on inventions, encouraging people to have copyright and trademark and all this other stuff, then they would be able to, uh, derive some kind of financial benefit from it and be an encouragement for them to make and do more goodies. All right. That's so correct. I can I can understand that concept. So but is it really a natural right? Well, we've made the argument that not really. I mean, it's an idea. You're patenting someone's idea that somebody else can come up with that ID idea independently. Nope, you can't do it. You can't produce it. You can't sell it. You can't because somebody else thought of it first. And the way you thought of it is too close to the way he thought of it, even though it's different and you're using plastic instead of carbon fiber and, and whatever. And because we said, okay, and then you get in there calling Stefan to be the patent attorney and go defend me. So I'm, I, I understand this. Now we're getting into a little bit of the utilitarian argument is that are we really, in the long term, better served as individuals and as humanity by having this concept of intellectual property? And that's kind of where we're going now, and I kind of want to hear what your uh, summarized comments on that is. Well, so I would say this. Look, when you and I or when normal people discuss principles and morals and norms, 
you know, you can argue that abortion is wrong, abortion is right, murder is wrong, murder is okay in some cases. It's not an empirical or utilitarian argument, and we can come up with reasons for that, religious reasons or moral reasons or practical reasons or, or traditional reasons, whatever. But when you make an explicitly utilitarian argument, when you say we need to have this intervention, this temporary limitation on people's rights for this benefit, this, you, this practical sort of wealth-based or money-based benefit, then it's impinging on you to come up with, you know, to satisfy the burden of proof. And you could almost forgive the founders for, you know, they only had like a 10-year or something monopoly for copyrights. It was very short. So you could understand they would think, well, it's going to have some benefit for sure and maybe not a big cost. And even if it's a cost, it's not going to last that long. Well, now you have copyrights lasting literally over 100 years. I'm not kidding you. Okay? It's crazy. And you have patents lasting, say, a- approximately 17 years now, but in the Internet age, that's an infinity, right? Because, patent, you know, ideas are over in five years sometimes now. So basically, it's the entire life of the idea. So you would think that they would have come up with some evidence by now to prove their case, but they have not. I mean, look, I, I, let me just read you just two sentences from this guy, Fritz Macklup, who's a respected economist. This is back in 1958. He did an entire study commissioned by Congress. And he said, he concluded, no economist on the basis of present knowledge could state with certainty that the patent system as it now operates confers a net benefit or net loss in society. And then he talks about the assumption. And then he says, if we did not have a patent system, it would be irresponsible on the basis of our current knowledge to, in- to recommend instituting one. Okay, so, I mean, even, now this is just a mainstream sort of economist looking at the si- situation. And there has been nothing since then. All the studies that they keep doing conclude the opposite of what the utilitarian advocates say. Now, as a libertarian who's a principled libertarian, I would say I don't accept utilitarian arguments in the first place because there are, there are at least two problems with them. Number one, as we know from Austrian economics, values are not measurable by numbers. Okay? Values are subjective, and they're just rankings. I prefer this over that. You can't put a number on it. And even if you could, you can't compare them between people. And even if you could do that, it's still wrong to take from me to give to you. Even if you argue that what you took from me hurts me less than it benefited the guy I gave it to. I mean, that is theft. You know, we have some principles here. We're against theft. So the utilitarian arguments fail, and they're bankrupt in the first place. Okay. I'm I'm with you. I just want to make sure that we can, uh, I can repeat this Mm -hmm. in the future and take Stefan's position, okay? Okay. So let's go ahead and make sure I can get my rhetoric down because it's all about bumper stickers, man. All right. So I'm, um, it's easy to make the argument or easier. I mean, of course, you got some collectivists that would make, uh, you know, nobody owns anything. It belongs to everybody and you're not using it's mine now. Mm -hmm. But uh, so let's go ahead and operate from the concept that, uh, I make something, I purchased something, I got something, I mm-hmm. created something, mm-hmm. and I'm holding my hand, it's mine. Mm-hmm. Then I have something that is, uh, I, I made something, I created something, mm-hmm. it's mine, but it can be duplicated without yes. any detriment to me. Yes. So, I mean, that's really what we're talking about. Yes. So we have, and that takes the form in a, a lot of different areas. I mean, yeah. it's a, uh, and, and the solution has been a lot of people go, well, how would they ever? Well, it always happens. It, it's where the real money is made. Merchandising. I mean, you right. know, it's, it's like, uh, you know, you watch uh, Spaceballs, the movie is a spoof on Star Wars, and they get, you know, you know, yogurt, you know, the Yoda character, Mel Brooks, in there, and he goes, oh, yeah, we're, we're, we're going to meet all again in Spaceballs 2, the search for more money. I mean, you know, yeah. so it was, he go, opens up his little shop there, and it has Spaceballs, the lunchbox, Spaceballs, the coloring book, Spaceballs, the flamethrower. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's the merchandising. That that's tangible stuff, okay? Yes. Now, the actual replication or duplication copying of the movie Spaceballs, that in itself is just another marketing tool for them to go buy more merchandise. Look, I, I, w- I would say this. Look, I often get this. When I, when I point out the, the problems with IP, you, you'll get this sort of knee-jerk response. Well, how would I make money? And my response, my first response is, the fact that you have a question is not a political argument. You know, I mean, this is the job of entrepreneurs to figure out how to make money. We, we're, contrary to the IP advocates' demonization of, of, the, of, of us property libertarians, we are not opposed to the intellect. We are not opposed to ideas. 
ideas are essentially important. As I explained earlier, they are what guides human action. Okay, but because they're important, then they can spread um, uh, to, to people. But people have always had to deal with sort of the problem of marketing in a world where some things are easily reproducible and some things are not. This is what competition on the market is. When a new store opens up with a new type of product, or let's say a grocery store has wide aisles that the customers like, you know what's going to happen? Emulation. The other grocery stores are going to start emulating that feature. And there is no objective way to draw a line between that kind of good emulative behavior and what the patent and copyright laws seek to protect. I mean, I'm telling you, this stuff is completely arbitrary. Uh, it's just stuff that Congressman wrote down on, on a piece of paper. It's not arbitrary. It is not objective at all. And the, and, and the way the courts and the Patent and Copyright Office interpret these things is almost completely arbitrary because these are just decreed arbitrary laws and regulations and rules. Well, as a patent attorney, as you're going through these things, when you have something, where is the line between someone else's improvement or innovation and, you know, after a while, you got millions and millions and millions of patents on file. I mean, they, yeah. can, they can say anything is like something else because of the shape. I mean, you know, I, I'm, well, I, is, where does you know, it stop? The, the, the problem with, with IP law is that there are so many problems that I could explain to you on so many different levels. But whenever you talk to these sort of snaky IP advocates, every time you point one of these blatant problems out, like let's say I point out that, well, you know, you happen to favor uh, the, f the fact that there's a natural right to the first guy who comes up with something gets the right to it. Are you aware that in the American system it's, it's the other way around? Well, then they'll say, well, I'm not in favor of that. Or if you say, well, are you aware that if someone independently invents something, even if they invent it before, before you patented it, they can be prohibited by an injunction from a court from using their process? Then the, the guy will say, well, I'm not in favor of that. Well, then you say, well, what are you in favor of? They'll say, well, I'm not an IP expert. I don't know. So basically, they don't know what they're in favor of. <laughs> You know, I, I appreciate you staying over because um, I, I think, you know, from our conversation, we brought up a lot of things that people can think about, and then we can start to summarize into a, a philosophy that's well understood by people that had never even thought of this before. You know, maybe we'll get into Mickey Mouse. How long does Disney get to own Mickey Mouse? I don't know. You know, we'll, we'll find out. And we'll talk about piracy of music and videos. You know, wh where does it end? Where does it stop? Then we have to change our entire concept of what is and is not property that can be protected by the force of government, or should be. You know, these are the questions that get down to the nitty-gritty here on Declare Your Independence. Me, Ernest Hancock, and my guest, Stefan Kinsella. We'll be right back. do it anyway so i'm i i'm hoping that we understand that we live in a time that where you're looking that's why when we were talking with uh, drew they've been up to the action conference up in salt lake city all these young people and different rights organizations there and and the biggest thing is you only get you know a couple hundred people go to this thing which is fine you know because a lot of the people there were the activists they were sharing with each other I, I've been to these things. Heck, we do the Freedom Summit. comes up the first weekend this December. Go to freedomsummit.com. You'll see a lot of great speakers. You know, we pretty much got it done. We'll start promoting it heavy here pretty quick. But I'm, I'm, I just want to make sure you understand the power of us just understanding what's going on so as individuals we don't fall right into the trap. And if you were taught anything in government schools, which, of course, that's the last place you're going to hear anything like this, about what the proper role of government is, how you should organize your finances, what is and is not moral behavior, what's right, what's wrong. If you're able to do that, you pretty much can insulate yourself from a lot of bad decisions just by listening to what Grandma had to say. Yeah, everything you need to know you learned in kindergarten. Yep. Well, we'll go over some of the headlines in the news today. There's some things I want to talk to you about. Uh, looks like Newsweek is... You know, got saved a little bit, but mainstream media is going away. Freedom's the answer. What's the question? You're listening to Ernest Hancock.
Then you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone For the times they are changing Yeah, they sure are. But a lot of us have been predicting what was going to happen. You know, this is, uh, i I'll give you an example. There's some news that's coming out in the last uh, day or two that, you know, really kind of tells you where the future is going. Newsweek is a property of the Washington Post. It's, uh, you know, plummeting like a stone in its values and its uh, debt. I mean, it's got $15 million a year rent, you know, in New York. It's got an enormous overhead. It's the second largest publication, uh, weekly publication behind time. So what happened with Newsweek is that you had a, a, a an icon, you know, and it's just more propaganda into the Matrix kind of crap. You know, I I can't stand it. You know, I I I, I, I fly a lot and going around speaking and so on, and and I always go to the Borders Books thing at the airport, and I'll grab some science magazines or something to see what's on there. And you're just you're deluged with the cover art for each of these news magazines. You know, U.S. News and World Report or or Time, or Newsweek, and I didn't know what happened to the U.S. News and World Report. I don't see it much anymore. Maybe it went away. And what happens is, is you get the, whatever the propaganda in, in the cover, what value does it have to have shelf space at the front? You know, it, it's that has value just to promote whatever the heck it is that what's the headline. How much is that worth to have it every single news? Outlet, every grocery store, every 7-Eleven, every Circle K, every airport book uh, newspaper stand. You'll have Newsweek had, you know, here here's the injection. There was a movie that was called uh, They Live. And I remember it was a, you know, B science fiction thing, but it was really clever. And, and one of the things, it was subliminal messages. And if you put on these right kind of sunglasses, all of a sudden you saw all the magazines. All they said was obey, you know, consume, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, do whatever the heck it is that they wanted. And it was just kind of a, you know, play on, you know, you're just being programmed. Well, Newsweek, it, it's going out. It's ready to wink out. So here we have a gentleman named Sidney Harmon that comes in and buys it for a dollar. He goes, here's your dollar. Well, he took on all the liability for it, too. Well, a lot of the people that are working there are like, yay, at least we, you know, we got a job. We're going to, we're going to, instead of just closing up shop, we have Newsweek is going to continue to be published. Why? Is there something that Sidney wants to say? He's 91 years old. All right, you know, he was born in 1918. You know, he made his money uh, being in, you know, radio, you know, and sound and so on. He he did, uh, you know, had a career doing that. But uh, what a lot of people don't know, they're not making a big enough deal out of, in my mind, is he's married to Jane Harmon. Jane Harmon is uh, California's 36th Congressional District uh, House Representatives. She's the second richest member of the House. Over $160 million in assets that we know of. Now, the richest guy is some Republican named Daryl Issa, who represents a congressional district in California. So she she went from, after graduating from law school back in the late 60s, she began her political career in Washington, D.C., serving as chief counsel and staff director to the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Constitutional Rights. <laughs> In Washington, yeah, okay. She served in that position until moving over to the executive branch of government, serving as a special counsel to the Department of Defense. Okay, and as Deputy Secretary of the Cabinet, both positions in the Carter administration, she she held a brief teaching position at UCLA, and then she went on to run for Congress. Well, she's not short of cash, and being an attorney for the Department of Defense, uh, you would think she knows uh, how the the deck stacked. You know, I mean, what is anything a secret to her? Or the military industrial complex is you know lost on her. 
So, you know, she's yeah, they got all kinds of different controversies here. I remember, you know, the APAC controversy in October 06. Time magazine quoted anonymous sources asserting that an FBI and U.S. Department of Justice investigation of Harmon was underway. The magazine alleged that Harmon had agreed to lobby for the Department of Justice to reduce espionage charges against Steve Rosen and Keith Weissman, two officials at the American-Israeli Public Affairs Committee. You remember that? In exchange, Time said that there was a quid pro quo in which APAC would lobby then-House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi to appoint Harmon as chair of the House Intelligence Committee if the Democrats captured the House after a 2006 election. Harmon, the FBI, the FBI, the Justice Department, and Pelosi's office have all denied knowledge of or involvement with any investigation. APAC denied it and had engaged in a, that it had engaged in a quid pro quo with Harmon. APAC would never engage in a quid pro quo in relation to a federal investigation or any federal matter, and the notion that it would do so is preposterous, a spokesman at the time said. So it goes on and on and on. But So, so what do you have here? You have an attorney that goes and works for the Senate Subcommittee on Constitutional Rights. You know, so I always feel better about that. And then she becomes an attorney for the Department of... It's time for Declare Your Independence with Ernest Hancock. All right, I'll let you guys go ahead and have that. Stephen Kinsella, he's advocating for uh, no uh, intellectual property rights. There is no such thing. It doesn't exist, and you're, you've been duped. You know, you've been duped. Well, go ahead and, and let's go ahead and dwell on that just a little bit. We've talked about, Stefan, we've had the concept of property rights. You know, we, we agree that, you know, it's mine. i got to wrap my arms and legs around it's mine. Okay, we got property rights and a proper role, if you're going to have any government, is defense of property rights. You know, okay, we're all good on that. Then we got, you know, this this patenting, copyright, and trademarking of an idea, a concept. And, of course, the argument was is that that would propagate more innovation and invention and so on because they would financially benefit from it. Of course, back in the day, I'm sure there was someone that had an idea, an industry, and the big boys, and they wanted to protect uh, against competition from somebody you know, getting in on their gig. But um, we're looking at can you really, in, in, as a principled view of what is and is not the role of government to defend something that is somebody's, can you put a a arms and legs around an idea? Should we? I mean, just, just the practicality of it. And as we have the ability to digitize information and software and music and, and video, and it's just getting to the point that it's kind of a moot point. They can't accomplish it anyway. Correct. I agree with that. And, uh, I mean, let's, let's think for a second. What, what, even, what would a principled defensive IP be? What would a principled approach be? I mean, would it be infinite terms? Because right now they're finite. Okay, Almost every proponent of IP believes in some finite term, like a copyright should last 110, 120 years, 50 years, whatever. And they'll change it later anyway. Yeah, so, so in other words, either you believe in some finite term or you think they should last forever. Now, there are a couple of uh, IP advocates like Galambos and, and uh, I think uh, even Spooner. They believed that they should be perpetual. Now, to me, that's insanity because that would mean by now we would all be paying royalties every time you did anything. If you flush the toilet, if you light a match, you know, you're going to pay royalties to some, some descendant of the original caveman who invented this or the original guy who invented the first toilet, whatever. I mean, it would basically ensnare the, all the world of action and we would be paralyzed and we would die. So that is why no one believes in infinite IP rights. So that means they believe in some term of patent rights and copyrights. Zero, not infinite. So what should it be? Should it be 50 years? Should it be 10 years? Should it be five years? How do they know? How do they know they're at the top of their curve, let's say? Freedom's the answer. What's the question? See, if you can get down to the principle, then you don't have to worry about all these subjective decisions. Let's go ahead and go to the uh, uh, callers. Barry Hess from Arizona. Go ahead, man. Hey, uh, hi, Ernie, and, and I appreciate the conversation here tonight. I'll, I'll get right to it because 
Uh, I am a libertarian, and I'm not in total agreement. I, I'm, I really have some kind of difficulties in thinking that if we were to remove all patents and copyrights, we would also stymie any innovation and creativity or an incentive thereof, or even more importantly, the ability for the artist or the creator to uh, maintain their lifestyle, to derive some kind of pecuniary interest from it. Stephen, uh, let me let me go ahead and ask Barry a question. Sure. Is is that the um, the goal of any kind of a law or a philosophy or something is to um, give them incentive. I mean, that, that was the thing that bothered me the most about Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution. To promote the sciences and arts, we're going to do fill-in-the-blank and have this patent stuff. And I'm going, since when was that the role of government is to promote anything? You know, I, I'm just, you know, so that's what we're talking about here. We're trying to get down to the protection of property rights, and they call it intellectual property, which means that you can own an idea. I mean, so the question is, um, should you be able to own an idea, and what detrimental effect would that have or positive effect would that have on society? Well, I, I'm not sure that, uh, you know, you cannot own your own idea, depending on and and that's, I didn't even want to get into that part of it. Well, I mean, that's what it's all about. It's all about owning an idea. But you had asked about it as providing an incentive. I I think that the the patent office should be restructured merely to protect, uh, but then you run into all the the conflagration that you guys have been talking about, uh, perhaps with a little modification, like uh, requiring there could not be a secret patent and that uh, limit, very limited, we do have limited exclusivity at this time, but I, I would encourage uh, the Patent Office to be restructured to, a, you know, reflect that we allow free use of anything out there with an automatic compensation to the originator, and the only purpose the Patent Office should serve is simply to protect those rights uh, along the same lines as they do for uh, song artists and you know, well, see, that's where we're getting. We're getting the copyright. And what's the difference, Stefan, between copyrights and well, trademarks and patents? Is it all kind of the same thing? So, no, there's differences. Copyrights basically create creative, uh, they protect creative expression, okay, like a song or artwork. And actually, it's automatic. If you, uh, if you write down something in an email or on a book, you instantly get copyright protection. And whether you want it or not, it's almost impossible to get rid of. Patents you have to apply for, and the, and the term is a lot shorter. Um, now, there is this regulated scheme called ASCAP, which is even worse, okay, because the government comes in and dictates the royalties people get, which is, I think, what Barry's advocating we should have in the patent system. We should make the patent system more like copyright. But, I mean, look, Barry said a couple of things. Number one, he said that if we don't have these systems, uh, if we get rid of them, then innovation would be stymied. Now, le- Barry, let me ask you, first of all, do you agree that the burden of proof is on anyone who advocates setting up this system in the first place, or is it, or is the burden of proof on us to, to advocate abolishing a government grant of privilege that Congress has enacted? I, well, I don't know. I, I don't have a problem abandoning government altogether, uh, but as while it's there, I, I see that there there could be some useful uh, usefulness to it in protecting the rights, at least to the extent where an artist could could survive. I mean, otherwise, you, you put one song on the Internet, it's duplicated a million times, and poof, it's gone. Uh, I can empathize with some of the singers. In the Better internet. start selling some T-shirts. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I would say this. I mean, first of all, when you say innovation is stymied, you, you cannot seriously argue that there would be no innovation. All you can argue is that there's n- there would be less innovation, that there, there wouldn't be enough innovation. So I would ask you, what is enough innovation, and how do you know we have enough, and how do you know we didn't have enough if we don't have IP law? And, uh, you know, as a matter of fact, libertarians who argue exactly the same way literally have come out in favor of, I have one right here, Alexander Tabarrok, who's a libertarian, has argued in favor of an $80 billion tax-funded medical innovation prize fund to replace the patent system. Whoa. So, you know, so these guys think the patent monopoly doesn't give you enough of an incentive. So we should just go ahead and be honest about it, steal money from the taxpayers, and go ahead and give it directly to these 
innovators that the government committees think are, are brilliant enough to deserve well, the Well, they're reward. already doing it. NASA's got, uh, you know, yes. lunar landers that they want to do. It's kind of like the Anasari X Prize, which is private. And so NASA sees the benefit of, you know, um, civilian commercial uh, space flight coming out, and they're going, well, hey, we'll do that, and we'll just rip off taxpayer and, and do it our way. And, yeah, and in fact, there's a close connection between all these arguments for government research I mean, how many times have you heard the stupid argument that if we didn't have the multi-billion dollar space program, we wouldn't have Tang? I mean, I'm so sick of this argument. It's ridiculous. I mean, let's say we wouldn't have Tang. Is Tang worth $100 billion or whatever the, the space program costs? <laughs> you know, what, what did we not get that we would have gotten if that money had been privately invested? Well, you raised some really good questions. You've got me thinking about is this is a subject that comes up here and again. Uh, but it's not one that's ever discussed in depth. So, uh, Ernie, I, I will let you guys get back to it. I'm enjoying the conversation. I didn't want to interrupt, but I, I was curious as to your thoughts on that, uh, the idea of modifying it just as a registry. Uh, we really well, pretty much well then you got to register, you know, intellectual property as, intellect, as if thought, as if uh, an idea can become property in, in, in equated with land or something i'm just you know i understand it is a good subject are we able to keep you another segment Stefan? absolutely thank you thank you thank you you've been very patient with us because we're this is something we're all very interested in and we'll talk about some more when we come back here on declare your independence there are those that just want to be left alone and those that just won't leave them alone which one are you the Ernest Hancock Show. Turn on the tube, and what do I see? A whole lot of people crying, don't blame me. They point their crooked little fingers at everybody else. Spend all the time feeling sorry for themselves. Think of my this, think of my that. Your mama's too thin. Oh, I'm sorry, I was distracted. I was reading. I shouldn't have been reading. You know, <laughs> headphones off. We're back with Stefan Kinsella, K I N S E L L A dot. Oh, Law.com, CanceloLaw.com. Now, let's go ahead and discuss, you know, kind of what the solution is. Because where we're at now is that we're at a point to where we would have to take patent, intellectual property, copyright, trademark, all of that, and just sweep it away. What would we we'd be left with? Well, um, I think, look. Trademark is not as bad as patent and copyright. There are problems with it. Trade secret has problems, too. But the, the primary culprits here are copyright and patent. Not surprisingly, they're federal government creations primarily. Trademark and trade secret have their roots in the common law, and there are aspects of them that you could, you could argue in favor of. Uh, trademark can be based upon fraud. Trade secret could be based upon um, contract and property rights and trespass, things like that. Um, I, I think we have to point out to people that this is basically mercantilism. It's a privilege. The utilitarian arguments are flawed, and they haven't been satisfied. But that's not a principled case. argument. I mean, you know, I, I really want to deal on a principled argument. Somebody is say, well, it, it would benefit us here based on what? I mean, based on whose uh, uh, determination of what is a benefit? The government? Yeah, I want that. What, the, the church? Yeah, I want them to do it. The, uh, the schools? Yeah. I mean, you know, there's no monopoly that I want to give any kind of power to tell me how I'm being benefited or not. So I mean, I want, I, I would, look, let, let's, look at, let's look at it from a practical point of view. The primary arguments in favor of these things is that, you know, it helps copyright helps spur artistic creation, right? And patents help spur innovation. Now, let's look at them for a second. What copyright really does in the real world, this is today, okay? Most authors, for example, of novels and books, they don't really make money from copyright. The publishers do, and the publishers reap a large part of it. So basically, and especially, let's say you have a long-dead author, I mean, their work is being suppressed because the work's out of print, no one can copy it, and the publisher's charging a lot of money for any remaining prints. So the publisher gets the benefit of that. Nowadays, you will see all these models being turned to by authors, even popular authors. They're just publishing it themselves. I mean, let's say an author makes $2 for a, a book, for a $20 book. The publisher gets the rest, and the rest is overhead for paper. I mean, an author who's well-known can just put up a file on Kindle – Sell it for three dollars, let's say. He makes three dollars almost pure profit and no there's no middleman. So there are ways around these things. Now let's take patents. Most people are not aware of this, but most patents 
by independent inventors, let's say, are completely useless. They are just wallpaper. The guy spends seven, eight, ten, twenty thousand dollars get this piece of paper to brag to his friends, or to, you know, but it does him no good whatsoever. Most companies that get patents, do you know why they get them? They get them for defensive purposes. They they basically build up an armory of patents around themselves simply to assert against other big companies if they get sued as a patent infringement. So it's like a porcupine defense. So you have all these millions and millions of dollars being spent on patent attorney fees and patent office fees just to build up shields to not use against each other. And further, what typically happens is this hurts the small companies. Why? Because two big companies, let's say Dell and HP, you know, if one of them sues the other, you know what they're going to do? They're going to assert patents back against each other, and they're going to have a settlement. And you know what the settlement means? They're going to have a license with each other. They're going to cross-license to each other their patents. So each one gets to keep doing what they were doing with the, with the fear of being sued by the other big guy gone now. What about little guys? They have no patents they can defend themselves with, so they're vulnerable. So this creates barriers to entry. So basically, copyrights don't help small authors and small creators, and patents don't help small independent inventors or small companies. They're basically huge waste on society. And as I said, there are all kind of creative things people are coming up with now to make money in the face of uh, scarcity and non-scarce ideas. And this is not a new thing. Let me give you one il- illustrative example that a- always has caught my uh, uh, my mind. Uh, you're familiar with drive-in theaters, and they're, they're, so, they're not that common anymore, but they used to be popular. In the beginning, they had a big movie screen with speakers. Now, what happened? You had free riders. You had people that would sit on the neighboring hillsides or roads and watch the movie for free. So what did the owners do? They installed these little speakers on a per-car basis, right, which sound crappy and which cost them money to install. Now, why did they do this? They did this to exclude free riders. Now, they're entrepreneurs. They were creative. They thought of a way to overcome a free rider problem to try to calculate, uh, to try to capture profits from, from customers. And they did a calculation. Is this worth it to me or not? If it had cost a million dollars to put these speakers in, they wouldn't have done it. It wouldn't have been worthwhile, but they did. That's just a typical example of the fact that almost every business faces cost of exclusion, right? You have to have... Well, now they go a little AM radio signal or FM, and they can do it. But I, I understand your point. There's always a an innovative solution. But we just would have a different society with a different way of thinking. Let's go ahead and go to Scott from Cheyenne, Wyoming. He has a way of thinking, I'm sure. Go ahead and share it with us, Scott. Oh. Hi, Ernie. Um, yeah, it, it, you know, a lot of this discussion sounds like, well, you know, government screws things up and screws up everything they does, uh, film at 11. But, um, I, you know, I've been following Stefan's arguments online for a bit, and I've been uh, listening to the debates, and, and what it seems like it comes down to is, is Stefan is saying that people that make physical things, whether it's a unique item or if it's a mass-produced something that sells inexpensively to a lot of different people, deserve to be able to control the disposition of what they make. The people that make intellectual things or, or ideas or like art or, or music or whatever, uh, once once they share it with the first person, they completely lose control of it. And I don't see the justice in that. Uh, okay, so I, I would respond to that. Uh, that uh, That's a way of restating the fact that, that there's only property rights in scarce things. I mean, this is the way. Well, that's, that's an argument by definition, isn't it? You, you you basically defined intellectual property out of property. Well, intellectual just by, just by property taking, is not taking property. one very narrow view of what property is. Well, but IP is not property in scarce things. It is property rights in non-scarce things. And as a matter of fact, in the in, in the world of, of tangible things, whenever we have a dispute, whenever we have a lawsuit, whenever we have a fight, it always comes down to real things. For example, let's say you and I have a dispute over a tract of land. The winner right. is going to get right to, the right to control that piece of land. Or if you trespass against my house and I sue you and I win, you have to turn over to me physical money. Or maybe I get to punish you. Okay, So that's control of your body. It always comes down to control of physical things. Now, the people who advocate that you know non-tangible things are just as real property as uh, tangible things, like your argument implicitly presumes, you notice they never want to enforce their intangible rights in the intangible realm. They always want to enforce it in the real world. So, for example, if I 
infringe your copyright in your song. What do you want from me? You want money, which is a physical thing, or you want the court to issue a threat of physical force against my body or my property to stop me from doing something in the real physical world. Now, why is it that... Well, as if there is no connection between the intellectual things and the physical things. I mean, I have to use my mind, which exists, and my brain, which is a physical thing, in order to create this intangible property. And then if, if, uh, if my effort is, and my work is disrespected by, by people taking it without compensating me for it, then, then yeah, the, the, the connection is already there between the physical and the intangible. And when I, when I want a tangible compensation, it's because my tangible labor and my tangible mind has been ripped off. Yeah, and I, look, I understand your concern, and, but, but to me, what you're saying is you're not quite sure how in a world that only protected real property rights, how you could make money off of intangible things. But That's this, part of it, but not me, the whole is, thing. There's also, like, a matter, there's also a matter of, of respecting the originator of something. Yeah, I mean, okay. sometimes, sometimes people take a copyright in things not because they want to be able to make money from it, but because they want to prevent it from being used in ways that they would find appalling. Uh, newspapers will t- will copyright their articles not because they want to be the only ones to sell them, but because they want to prevent politicians from using them in their campaign material in cases where the the, you know, the politicians are someone that the newspaper opposes and embarrasses the newspaper. Well, that's that's a little bit confused. You're confusing trademark and copyright, which I'm not blaming you for. And in fact, this is part of the problem with IP laws. It's extremely arcane, yeah. and confusing to layman. But but look, let me tackle this. Uh, look. You said something about you create you create something. Well, that's a little bit begging the question because in reality, what do we do as humans? We find scarce resources in the world, and then we manipulate them or we rearrange right. them to make them more valuable to us, right? It's not like we inject some value in them and they become intrinsically more valuable with some extra in value quantity added into them. All you do is you take a block of marble and you, and you manipulate it, and you make it more valuable to you or maybe to someone you want to give it to or sell it to, right? Well, you know, sure, let's go, let's go ahead and finish. Yeah, we're, gonna, we're not going to finish this before. We're not going to finish this before they push the button on us. So, Scott, can you hold on for a little bit? Sure. Okay, let's go ahead and hold Scott from Cheyenne, Wyoming. I mean, he's going to hold on for this a little bit. we got uh, Stefan Kinsella on. Stefan, can you do another final segment with me? Stefan, can you? Yeah, All right, good, good, good. We'll, we'll get this finished when we come back. It's time for Declare Your Independence with Ernest Hancock. <laughs> it's a peaceful, easy feeling. We're going we're gonna to get to the bottom of this thing. We're going to find out, uh, I don't know, what, what can we advocate? You know, I'm always advocating for freedom. We just got to find out what that is. I mean, a lot of times it's really simple. It's really easy. But we've been brainwashed over, uh, I, I guess, centuries into this idea that we can take an idea and patent it, that we can limit the innovation and creativity and the building on top of other people's concepts and ideas and innovations that by protecting that have we really done ourselves a favor but we have scott from wyoming's going look man hey let me tell you what's tangible it's me doing it that's what's tangible i did it and uh now what so i and stefan was uh, responding to that and i want to give you an opportunity to finish your thought go ahead stefan well I mean, I would say this. Look, if you want to talk about a, a, an actual uh, practical sort of reasonable reform, number one, it would be to realize that um, we have rights to freedom of press, for example, because there are property rights respected in our property, right? So the fundamental thing is to respect property rights and then let people do what they want with their property. And the other thing is, as a consequence of that, to respect your contract rights and enforce contracts. And if people want to come up with contracts that – uh, that somehow limit the information related to I- objects that they sell to their customers, more power to them. They can use DRM, they can use contracts, and we should start enforcing contracts. We should stop uh, saying contracts shouldn't be enforced because of uh, uh, it, it's, it's an economic coercion or it's a contract of adhesion, which is a flypaper contract, things like this. If you enforce property rights, okay, and, and let's think about patents for a second. 
one of the reasons for patents is that we need them for pharmaceuticals, for example. Now, why do you need that? Well, to, to give more money to the pharmaceutical companies. Why do they need more money? Well, because they're taxed at a huge rate. They're subjected to huge regulations, and the FDA process itself saps their money and their resources. Why don't we talk about the federal government stopping the FDA process, stopping the regulations, stopping the taxes, and then we can stop relying on the federal government to come in as the white horse rescuer to give you a little bone of some kind of patent privilege to make up a little bit for all the damage it's doing to you in the first place. I mean, it's ridiculous for people to count on the, the government. I almost cursed. You know, this is it's an evil, evil, wicked thing, this government. Okay? You cannot count on the government to protect your rights. The government is the demon, the destroyer of our rights. Well, I, can, I think I can get Scott to give an amen to that, but let me ask you, Scott, if the, sure. if the trade-off was that um, you did away with a lot of this government, uh, in, in addition to this protection of intellectual property rights and patents and copyrights and trademarks and blah, 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 you get rid of that. Well, um, in addition to that, you get rid of all the regulation and licensing and the taxes and all that. Um, would that be a fair trade-off for you? You'd be okay with that? <laughs> Well, um, because to protect your intellectual property rights, yeah. you you have to have the government to do it. I mean, you're going. I want as a libertarian, no, I don't, I you don't said, agree I with want that. government I, I, to. I, I think that if private property could be protected uh, without a state, then intellectual property should right. be able to be protected with, without a state. I can't say exactly how that would be done. Exactly. Uh, but, you know, it's, that's a matter for entrepreneurs in, in the in the marketplace for law to work out. To well, borrow you know, well, I mean, look, the argument. Scott, would, do you think it's even conceivable that the Americans with Disabilities Act could possibly arise on a free market? I mean, look, these are legislative mm, schemes. Uh, some, the something, something roughly approximating it could. Yeah, no, I, I had a restaurant. Depending on the, how the way judges were on, on certain kinds of Well, disputes, yeah. regardless of, of judges, I, I I had a restaurant, and you know, I had all kinds of requirements of how big the bathroom was going to be and how many grab bars you had and how much you had and this and that, and you know, on and on and on and on and on. And a lot of these things are addressed you know, in the free market by, you know, what kind of customers do I want, you know, how many different types of diverse population do I want to get their money, you know, in order to uh, thrive and survive in the business environment. I mean, there's all kinds right. of, you know, incentives for me to do different things. You go, come eat pizza here, you, your wheelchair can fit. I mean, you know, I, there's all kinds of, you know, blacks are welcome. Or or I say, you know, it's a property right, and I, you, you only, you only black people with blue eyes and wearing sidearms can come uh, to my barber shop. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. I can do whatever I want, and then yeah, there's yeah, a... Well, you know, the, the the way this could be handled is, is through the concept of fraud. If you're saying we're open to the public, everyone welcome, well, then you better be able to accommodate everyone that wants to come in. If you don't want to accommodate everyone, well, then you put up a sign that says uh, cripples not accepted or blacks not accepted but, or but, whoever but you don't want to accommodate, not, and then you don't have a problem. The, but, that's, but, Scott, that's not permitted by the law, so you cannot Well, not, not the not current law, no. We're no, talking about how an anarchist law would work. You could not have the ADA. With without the government intervention, you couldn't have it. You Not have exactly it. like it. No, no. You, you. I, I don't deny that you could have some version of IP law in in, in terms of fraud law and contract law, but it's radically mm -hmm. limited in scope, and it's not the same thing as what we have now. Um, and by the way, you notice. I mean, I'm not picking on you, Scott, but Scott's hesitation at your question about the trade-off there, Ernest. And in fact, well, I had, I had to think about what he was asking me. Yeah. Well, but, you see, my my point is, is that you have a um, to protect intellectual property rights. You have to beg the question: Who's going to be protecting it? You have you to know? have a state, and not only not only that, Ernest. Um, if you think about it, by the logic of IP, okay. Now let let's take the Ayn, the Randians, right? The Ayn, Ayn Rand types who believe in a minimal government, right? And they always struggle with the idea of trying to justify how we can tax people. And Ayn Rand could never find a way to justify taxation, but she wasn't for anarchy either, right? Well, but she also believed in IP. And if you believe in IP and you worship the original Constitution like she did, you could easily simply say, well, that's a benefit to humanity. It was a creative, innovative uh, governmental design. The government is giving, you know, is entitled to collect a royalty for this. Why not call that a tax? So, in other words, IP justifies the state. And you have to have a state to have IP. 
Ouch. Well, then, then you could also argue you have to have the state to have property. I mean, we, we don't argue that way. You know, we, we in the but libertarian you camp, we but argue you that property rights predate the state. And property only, rights do only, predate the state. Right. Roads predate huh? the state. Law predates the state. Morals predate well, the state. Well, slavery predates the state, too, and we got rid of it. I mean, just yes. because something has been, uh, has been, you know, with us some time immemorial doesn't mean it's right. We do have progress in civilization, at least along some fronts. No, no, no. But and one of, one of those is that we don't allow ownership of people anymore. Well, of course you now, do. Now, just because, you know, just because intellectual property rights have not been respected in, in the state's slapdash, ham-handed, haphazard way for only the last 150 years, that in itself doesn't mean they're not valid. Well, well let, let me say this. When I talk to IP advocates, of, uh, libertarian advocates of IP, I can point out I, – I mean, I could point out literally a hundred things right now that I'm sure you would agree with me. I'm, I'm not in favor of that. I'm not in favor sure. of that. I'm not in favor of that. And so I do this all the time. I talk to these IP guys, uh, these IP advocates, and I, I, I keep saying, well, here's the problem with it. Here's the problem with it. And they say, well, I'm not in favor of the current system. And yet they're opposing my call to abolish the current system. So that means they are in favor of it. And now, I, you're, well, you're calling for more than abolishing the current system. You're calling into question the whole idea that there can be intellectual property. That's correct. And that's much more fundamental than you know, what sort of uh, uh, institutions we ought to have to enforce laws. That's correct. But, but then when I ask someone like you, I say, well, you're, you're against A, B, C, D, E, F, G, everything I'm against. Yeah. What are you in favor of? Then the answer is, well, I'm not an IP expert. I don't know. So I, well, that's I, like I when you say that. That's, that's kind of like when uh, we ask, well, if we don't have IP, how are we going to be able to make a living? You say, well, that's not my problem. That's for you to figure out. And that's the answer. It's not my problem. That's the entrepreneur's problem. I mean, I mean, it's like a communist asking how many uh, uh, forms of toothpaste would there be in a free market? I don't know. Let's wait. Let let let's let it settle out and see. But when I hear well, people sure. like the, the previous caller say we should we should have a, 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 a improve the patent system, to my ears it's just like the tax reformist who says, well, we should go to a flat tax system or a national sales tax or a value added tax. I mean, all this bullshit. Where you know the truth is, we want no tax. We want to lower the tax rate. That's okay, it is, it is my it is my obligation as host on a FCC network that's controlled by the government <laughs> to say you said naughty trash can word. You're not supposed to do that. So there, I'm covered. That. Not nah, that, you know, you're confusing change, me with someone that cares. Change, change, change. Yeah, <laughs> change, change, <laughs> but my change. Point is, look, we, we cannot reform this around the edges. This is a government bureaucracy. It is I would agree cow. with that. It's a cash cow for the government. It is used for censorship, for oppression, and it is even being used in, in Russia. By the way, the, the recent story, Microsoft was cooperating with the Russian government to use IT law, patent law, to investigate political opponents of the regime. I mean, this is just par for the course. This is nothing but a government tool to control people and to give money, to transfer money to special interests of the state. Everyone does bad things. That's nothing new, but you're well, throwing out the baby with the bathwater. <laughs> Well, yeah. if it's Rosemary's baby, let it go, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's Barry Hess's thing. Yeah, I, I've yeah, heard him okay. say that before. You know, the thing that I, I really, at the at the fundamental part, of, yeah, I know who the, this is Scott Beezer, right? Yeah. Scott Beezer is a commercial graphic artist that does a great, in fact, he's the one that designed the Freedom's Phoenix Bird logo that we have, and he does a great job, and I, and I had you in mind when I, I had Stefan come on, because I know that, uh, you know, authors and artists such as you count on the intellectual property to be able to sustain a lot of it, what it is that you, uh, hold dear, which is, your creation you know i i understand this but i'm i'm really trying to get to a fundamental basis is that okay what's the fundamental thing that we want government to doing if you're going to have one at all protection of property rights and then in this concept of intellectual property i you know i'm, I'm still formulating but i i kind of lean in towards if i can patent if i can control an idea an innovation that makes me very powerful, and the uh, powerful guys that control me uh, get get theirs. I understand. It's a good issue. We'll be talking about it more. Stefan, thanks for coming on. We'll see you tomorrow.